Welcome to Bumps, Babies and Beyond. In this episode, we'll be discussing what life is like with a newborn baby, from the effects it has on your body. Yeah, you know, you wake up like Pamela Anderson with yeah. these rocks in your bra and you think you're going to explode. What happens when you have a premature baby? But all the time I'm thinking 24 weeks is the magic because at 24 weeks they uh, have the right to be resuscitated. Oh my god, that. that's just made my blood go cold. And I find out what it's like to give birth at home. Because we were in our own home and we were there together and it was intimate, when Marcus came it was just, he just fit in. To working out when to take your little one to the doctor. I was very, very paranoid with my first daughter. I had this sort of heightened fear that there would be something wrong. I also catch up with one inspirational mum who talks about what it's like bringing up a baby with Down syndrome. When they told me about the Downs, for me, that kind of paled in comparison to losing a child. Once your baby comes along, there's no going back. Everything changes from your body and lifestyle to the way you think and feel. I caught up with some mums to find out about their experiences. Um, I wish I'd known before I had children that I'd never go to the toilet on my own again. What I wish I'd known before I had kids was to put cream on constantly to avoid getting a crappy belly, which I didn't do and I have. <laughs> it's a bit of a shock to finally now have a couple of great big boobs. <laughs> so let's talk about the third day because uh -huh. I did not see that coming. <laughs> what was your third day like after giving birth? Yeah, you know, you wake up like Pamela Anderson with yeah. these rocks in your bra and you think you're going to explode, first of all. I mean, like, let's not make a mistake here, they are round, they are massive. It's like a surgeon snuck in in the night and put implants in you and you feel insane. Did you know what was happening? I sort of expected it and I woke up in the morning and it wasn't helped by my husband just laughing at me and asking <laughs> if he could take a photo. <laughs> I mean, I remember my partner walking in the room and just going, oh, they're fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you come near them. Don't touch them. I can't so, bear anyone touching them. They're so painful. Yeah. And then when you go to bed and you wake up and there's just milk all over oh, the sheets, it's soaked. you know, absolutely, completely soaked. And no one told me you can actually cut a pampers in half and put half down each bra. And then oh, so you do get a little bit of dignity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, a nappy in your bra. Something I was surprised at was my hair starting to fall out but until you're the one in the shower and then suddenly it's coming out it was coming out in clumps for me it blocks the plug it hole it blocks up. up the plug hole and then it's all over the sofa and then it's on the carpet you wake up in the morning and your pillow's yes. covered in it okay so you lost your hair as well yeah yeah it's when it actually happens and you think that's my hair oh my gosh it's my hair where's it all coming from a lot of mums are really worried that something's seriously wrong um, I have a lot of mums come in to me and you know, tell me they, they're losing all their hair and they're worried that something else is going on. So there's a lot of reassurance needed sometimes just to say, you know, this is normal. Let's be honest, there's no dignity to any of this, is there really? <laughs> Not for the woman anyway. This is it's odd, isn't it? Because all these things are happening, but women don't really talk about it all, do they? Did you get a lot of stretch marks? No, I was quite lucky. Mm. Did you get stretch marks? We don't call them stretch marks in our house, we call them flames of creation. So, oh, oh, nice and, uh, <laughs> yeah. You're a doctor and you're a mama. Do you think that everything can return to, to, to normal after having a vaginal birth? Yeah, I do. I think most people worry they're never the same again and what their partners, you know, think and experience. And I think it stops a lot of women going back to having a sex life after they've had their baby. And I think people do need to be able to talk about it. Um, and it's total taboo, really. You don't really sit around with your friends well, we're doing over it. coffee. We, we're yeah. gonna, we, we've got to get it out there so that people don't exactly. think of it as, as such a taboo. I had a vaginal birth. The advice I give you is don't do what I did and have a look with a mirror after a few days. Don't do it, is my advice. Give yourself a few weeks to recover. It does go back to normal. In, if anyone is really unhappy with what they're seeing, you know, afterwards, I think it's my first advice would always be to wait and, you know, give it some time. Oh, it's a dignified affair, isn't it? It is worth it. It's totally worth it. Well, it may not be dignified, but we're all in the same boat. So remember to wear your war wounds with pride. You've earned them. Babies come in all shapes and sizes. And in the UK, 7% of babies are born prematurely, which is before 37 weeks. Of those babies, one in 10 stands a chance of being permanently disabled. I caught up with one mum who shared her experiences. 
Now, Michaela, you had a premature baby. I mean, what happened? Well, um, I was pregnant for the first time. We were really, really excited. Um, and the pregnancy was going fine up until um, the 20-week scan. And the doctor said, oh, um, there's just something. It's, it's not very worrying. Um, he said, your cervix is a little bit short. And this can lead to problems and early birth. So come back in two weeks' time and we'll see how it goes. So I went about my normal life for another two weeks and they did another scan on my cervix and they said it's very short. Uh, in fact, it's, it's starting to open and you need to come in right now for emergency surgery, otherwise you will lose this baby. So what is it they needed to do to you exactly just to keep the baby in there? Um, well, they needed to put a stitch in my cervix and they explained that doing that was probably the only chance of keeping the baby for longer. By the time they actually got me on the table, which was the following morning, um, the surgeon actually said I was already dilated and you could see the baby's foot. <laughs> and then I was put on very strict bed rest. But unfortunately, we didn't get very far. And we were watching TV one evening, I was eating my dinner and my waters burst. And how, how many weeks are you now? I was 23 and five days. But all the time I'm thinking 24 weeks is the magic because at 24 weeks they uh, have the right to be resuscitated. But oh my God, that that's just made my blood go cold. Yeah. And then on the next morning, which was Friday morning, I was 24 weeks and one day and I started to get some backache. And the consultant came in and he had one look and he, <laughs> he went white as a sheet and he said, call neonatal, I can see the head. <laughs> and I'd actually been in labour all morning and nobody had known. It wasn't really until I came out of the surgery that we heard that we'd had a little boy and that he was still alive, but very, very sick and not really expected to live. He didn't look very healthy at all and he was absolutely tiny. How heavy was he? He was one pound six. <sighs> In the beginning few days, he was really fighting for his life every day. Um, but he just kept fighting and he just kept fighting. Every day you go through is a day closer and closer and stronger and eventually he pulled through and we were in for five months eventually. Did he have any complications? He did, yeah. Um, He's recovering from them pretty much now, but um, his main complication was his lungs. Because yeah. when they're first born that early, their lungs aren't ready. And unfortunately, keeping them alive actually damages their lungs. So having the ventilator for so long um, means his lungs didn't grow properly. And they're also quite stiff, so it's hard for him to breathe. And he, when he came home, he was actually still on oxygen for a long time. Um, but now he's off. Um, and he shouldn't climb Everest, he won't be an Olympic athlete, but he should be able to lead a normal life. You must look at him as your little miracle. Oh, he's just amazing. We, we've been so blessed. I think we would have given anything that day he was born to be where we are now. He will grow up a very happy and very loved boy. Wow, what a wonderful story of hope and what amazing support from the medical team. Now, 50 years ago, one in three women gave birth at home away from the support and care of a medical team in hospital. However, today, the figure is less than 3%. I caught up with one woman to hear about her experience. Now, Jennifer, you gave birth at home. What made you decide that? Well, for me, it was the most comfortable place for me to be at home. I was in the kitchen, I was in the living room, I was in the bathroom, I was in the bedroom. I was, you know, everywhere except for the garden. <laughs> so. So where did you actually give birth? On the bed, but you're walking around and moving around and trying to push. I tried to push on the toilet. I tried to push squatting in my kitchen. I tried to push. And ultimately, I was most comfortable hanging onto the back of the bed and kneeling. And that's how Marcus was born. So I mean, let me answer that. Your husband filmed you giving birth? Yes. He, uh, <laughs> just on our little, you know, camera. Is it on? Are you kidding? And while you're moving around the house, mm. what's, what's your husband doing? 
um, anything I told him to do. I mean, we labored alone, just the two of us, all Friday night. And it's a real bonding experience to go through that together. And I think it's really important to do that. You're about to become a family and you better be keyed in and in sync with each other. And that's one of the things that I really felt came out of our birth was that because we were in our own home and we were there together and it was intimate, you know, when Marcus came, it was just, he just fit in. How do you prepare for a home birth? Because all I can think about is the mess. Well, everybody asks that, and it's actually a lot easier and cleaner than everybody imagines. So, okay, so what's the, midwife, setup like? the midwife brings this huge bag of stuff, and she's like a couple weeks before you're due, and it's in the house, and you're not supposed to look in it because just, you know, I don't know, for surprise factor, I don't know. But then... Um, <laughs> In it are towels and pads. Oh, so you look. And no, 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 because I, then I saw what was coming out of it when we actually got started. So they just laid down towels, and it was, it was fine. It soaked up all of the stuff. For me, I never even considered the idea of a home birth mm. because if something goes wrong, I want professionals there. A lot of the problems that women have, they show up quite early, and you can get to a hospital in time, usually if you're close to a hospital. I mean, I'm minutes away from a hospital. So. What would you say to another woman if, if they were thinking of or considering having a, a home birth? I would say that, you know, you need to think hard about what you want out of birth and what kind of environment do you want to be in. And a lot of women feel more secure being around doctors and equipment and um, a hospital. Uh, and I felt that being at home, I would feel more comfortable. So you wouldn't change a single thing? No, and the thing about having a home birth is you walk around your home and you remember those moments. That's where your son plopped out into the world. It was beautiful. It was absolutely everything we wanted in a birth. I'll be honest, I didn't think at the beginning of this conversation that this would just be even something I'd consider. Yeah. But do you find that when you speak so candidly, people maybe reassess how they feel about it. Yeah, I've changed hearts and minds of a couple of people. Women are really powerful and our bodies know how to do this. And if we give them the right circumstances, then they'll produce beautiful babies and beautiful experiences. And what better place to do this than in your own home? Mm. I mean, it worked for me, it won't work for everyone. But, you know, considering it is, is really important, I think. Jennifer, thank you so much for, for sharing your story. Oh, thank you. Listening to Jennifer's story really made me question my own assumptions about home births. Join me for part two, where we look at when is it right to take your child to the doctor? I was very, very paranoid with my first daughter. I had this sort of heightened fear that there would be something wrong. And I catch up on one woman's inspirational story about raising a child with Down syndrome. Well, I just hope that I can give her a good life, and that, that's kind of the thought that made me cry. Probably made me cry now again. <laughs> Welcome back to Bumps, Babies and Beyond. Later, I catch up with one mum who tells me her inspirational story about raising a baby with Down syndrome. When they told me about the Downs, for me, that kind of paled in comparison to losing a child. But first, I chat to a group of mums about when it's right to take your baby to the doctor. Most first-time mums are a little bit anxious, but throw in a sniffle and a rash, well, that's enough to send most sane and practical mums into a tailspin. Um, the first time my first child got sick, we tried to research it, but sometimes we go to the pediatrician, sometimes we just let it ride its course. When my first son first got ill, it was quite scary, because obviously you don't really know if your gut instincts is right. It's scary, very scary. Um, yeah, and I think at the time it was only a cold. Now, I remember when Ava got her first rash, it was actually a really scary time. And I used to think of myself yeah. not as a hypochondriac or anything like that, but everything just changes, doesn't it? First time you've got something wrong with this, you know, perfect bundle, and your first emotion is, ah, oh, what 
fear, terror. But you're not only a GP, you're a new mum. So I now, am, yeah. does that make you a killer combination where you understand now just how neurotic us mums can get? Or? I understand my mums a lot better. Um, and I can see it all in myself because being having a bit of medical knowledge, you know, you feel totally responsible um, for this baby and you want to make sure you're doing everything right. I have some sort of practical knowledge now as opposed to just the theoretical. I mean, is this a normal reaction? Is this what you see from oh, mums? You're a GP. Totally normal. I remember actually having a first-time mum come in with her baby with baby acne and she thought her face had exploded and she was absolutely terrified. And it actually took, I think, sort of three visits to us for her to, you know, be reassured. I was very, very paranoid with my first daughter. I had this sort of heightened fear that there would be something wrong. Um, and I, uh, I used to be at my GPs on a very, very regular basis. God forbid your baby gets ill in any way, but, do, you know, do you, do you find it easy to go to the doctor when, when they do? I I have to admit I don't. You do have that fear that they may look at you as being a neurotic mother and almost wasting their time as well. That's my biggest fear that they, they sort of, I worry that they'll think, you know, I've got a million actually sick patients to see. Yeah, and this person's you're legs wasting, falling off Absolutely, here. and you're wasting my time with a little rash and things. And you do kind of worry, and it does I mean, sometimes these, put you off. Are, are these fears, are these rational fears? I can understand why people have the, have exactly these feelings. I don't think we've, we ever judge people and say, oh goodness, you know, what are you wasting my time for? Especially not with, with little ones. Yeah. Um, because I'm always so much happier to see somebody and reassure them um, than to have somebody sitting at home panicking. You're a mum at home, you're looking at your baby, what are the signs that you should be worried about? The things I'd be worried about is a, a tiny baby, a temperature that's not coming down, um, baby who's sleeping much more than usual, who isn't really rousable, a baby who becomes floppy or stiff. Um, I think we've all, you know, we talked about the meningitis rash, but that's a red or purpley rash that doesn't disappear under pressure. Um, but I think as GPs, we all take mum's concerns really seriously because sometimes mums just know. Yes. And it's that really strong feeling that we should never ignore. There you have it, from the mouth of a GP. If you're worried about something, go and see a doctor. You're not being a hypochondriac. And remember, mother knows best. Now, although the chances of having a baby born with Down syndrome are higher in older women, more children with Down syndrome are being born to mothers that are younger. In fact, one in 1,000 babies will be born with Down syndrome. Now, Yona, I want to hear all about your family because your daughter, your second child, has Down syndrome. Well, I have a um, four-year-old son, Sisu. Um, I was 30 years old when I had him. Um, he was perfectly healthy, big baby boy. Okay, so um, then you got pregnant again when you were how old? Only a year and a half later, so um, 32 years old. Got pregnant again. Um, at my 12-week scan, was told that there was an increased risk of Down syndrome. When they came back and said there's a high possibility of Down syndrome, what did you think? Well, um, they said it was a risk of one out of 110, but still uh, they kind of pulled me aside to a room, gave me brochures about Down syndrome immediately. She told me um, that she was going to refer me to a sort of a local, bigger hospital that was going to um, talk to me about testing and possibly um, terminating the pregnancy if the condition was there. My goodness, so you've literally just had the scan, all the test results have come through, they've given you brochures and, and the opportunity to go and terminate the pregnancy. This within just a few minutes. Wow. I was lying there happy, happy to see my baby for the first time and then it's boom. <laughs> so when you got this information that now you're not going to be able to confirm whether mm. the baby is Down syndrome or not, how did you then progress forward? It was a difficult couple of months because you kind of want to talk about it around you but then people are saying oh but it's not really an increased risk you know I had a risk of one out of 40 and I didn't have a baby with Down. So you know they, they offered you a termination did yes. this did this ever become an option for you? No from the beginning I knew I wouldn't terminate but I'd lost the baby um, just a month before I got pregnant so when they told me about the Downs for me that kind of paled in comparison to losing a child. So when you, when you had the results and it showed that she was Down mm. syndrome, yeah. what did that feel like to be told that? The lady sat me down and said, look, she has it. And I think I had a, had a little cry. Of course. Um, but I said, well, I just hope that I can give her a good life. And that, that's kind of the thought that made me cry. Probably made me cry now again. <laughs> the big day, Labour Day? Yes, um, went into labour on my due date. Oh, well done. <laughs> An hour later, she was born.
she just looked like a perfectly normal baby for me. You know, obviously I could see some of the characteristics of Down syndrome. So if she had these sort of exotic eyes, but then, you know, and it's just beautiful. If you see my daughter now, um, you know, she's doing all the normal things. Um, she's learned to walk as well. So she's just absolutely brilliant. I mean, it doesn't feel like, you know, it's changed your family in any other way that another newborn would change your family? Well, the, the only thing that has changed is all the appointments that she has and there's health problems that she's more prone to, um, problems with eyes, ears, her heart. I can't go to work full time. What are your, your wishes for her? Well, I kind of hope that she'll go to a mainstream school, just hoping that she'll be able to make some of her own decisions. Um, live independently or semi-independently as she gets older. And doesn't... But, I mean, those wishes are no different for, mm. for a parent who's got what is known as a healthy, mm. happy child. Yes. I mean, your, your child she just sounds wonderful. I feel like I'm the lucky one. So if you are raising a child that needs extra support, do remember that you still share all the same hopes and fears as every mum. Sadly, that's the end of this episode of Bumps, Babies and Beyond. I hope that you found our films helpful and informative. We'll see you soon.